the subject, as you uh, heard from John there, is what to do about Syria. This is not going to be the formal kind of Oxford Union style debate that some regulars to Intelligence Squared are used to. It's rather going to be something uh, different, more uh, in, in a way conversational and discursive. We're going to try and really tease out all the different issues with uh, a really hugely expert uh, lineup uh, who I'm going to introduce properly in a moment. Just to say something about how we're going to do it, we, in the first chunk of time that we have, we're going to have uh, a conversation which in this, uh, from my vantage point here, able to look down upon both panelists and audience, ideal. Um, I'm going to be firing questions and thoughts to uh, our six panelists and they'll then speak uh, hopefully amongst themselves and uh, reacting to each other. And then in the second half I'm going to open it out for thoughts and uh, uh, contributions. Normally what we do, as you know, if you're a regular to Intelligence Squared, is we have a formal vote as you go in and a formal vote as you go out. We're not going to do that this time with yes and no, etc. But I did want to just gauge opinion in the room, and I think it'll be useful for our speakers as well, um, just where, we all, where we're sort of coming from, uh, on what we, to this question of what we should do. And so very crudely, and it is very crudely, but if I was to say three options, and don't worry, I'm going to say them all first, and then I'm going to ask you to put your hands up for which one very crudely and roughly you're with. If you think the best thing that we, and I suppose we mean by that Britain and the West, uh, if you think the West and those outside the international community should do nothing, that's going to be one choice. Another one will be that, yes, we, the West, should do something, and that is to arm the opposition to the Assad regime. That's the second option. And then the third one will be direct military intervention. So the West actually sending in military force, whether that's uh, by whatever means. So those are your options. And I'm, I'm just going to get a sense of the room now, and then we'll get another sense of the room at the end of the uh, proceedings. So those who think we, broadly defined, should do nothing, that our best is to stay out of it. OK, you can all see that. Luckily, it's not on the radio, where I have to say how many people have put their hands up. <laughs> Second option is to arm the opposition. Stay out of it, but arming the opposition. OK, so I would say that's similarly sort of number, maybe just narrowed it behind. And third option is direct military intervention in Syria. Okay, a few hands there. I would say that's probably the smallest group. And then the last category would be people who don't know and haven't yet made up their mind. Okay, so perhaps, so that gives us some, <laughs> some sense. So I think quite evenly divided, which is good quite evenly divided. So those are the options we're going to be getting to, but we're not going to move on to what sh exactly we should do first. We're going to talk about how we got here. Uh, and to do that, let me introduce um, our panel. Uh, first up, the editor of Barada TV, a Syrian pro-democracy satellite channel, and a founder member of the Movement for Justice and Development, Malik Abde. You can applaud if you want, but you don't have to. <laughs> Next to him, a very distinguished uh, journalist, former foreign editor of the New York Times, currently a columnist for the International Herald Tribune and the New York Times, Roger Cohen. <laughs> Next to him, a commentator who has followed Syrian affairs closely for years in the British press, herself born there, writer and broadcaster, Rana Kabani. And I know you're going to give, and you already have given, a very warm welcome to uh, the next panellist, the Sunday Times cameraman and filmmaker who was seriously injured in Homs in February 2012 alongside the much-missed Marie Colvin. He's come to us tonight, quite literally, from his hospital bed, Paul Conroy. Next uh, to him, also born in Syria, the Anglican priest and director and co-founder of the Awareness Foundation, Father Nadim Nasser. <laughs> and finally, a very uh, uh, prolific commentator on the region and on foreign policy in general, the communications director at the Henry Jackson Society, Michael Weiss. <laughs> Good. So that is um, our, our panel. And first off, I wanted to uh, go uh, d into how we got here, what exactly is going on. And I think uh, we'll all agree that the best place to do that is somebody who was there uh, absolutely um, on the ground and seeing it uh, and bringing the uh, testimony to the outside world, uh, Paul Conroy. <laughs> Let's start with you, Paul. 
until you had to leave. What were you seeing? Describe for us the situation as, as you followed it. Um, Syria, we'd, we'd all seen the activist videos that had come out onto the internet. Um, so I think that was everybody's general impression. It wasn't until we actually entered Syria that you realized just how closed down the, the whole place was. We couldn't move for more than 500 meters in a car. This was on the Lebanese border side we crossed. Um, it was an absolute lockdown. Civilians couldn't move. Army would open up. Anybody came to a checkpoint. It was 50-50. You'd either be fired up on or you'd be arrested. Um, movement was in virtually impossible without the help of the Free Syrian Army, which is also a slight misnomer. These are very lightly armed people with guns that have been brought out either from their from when they left the army and joined. So they're not a well-equipped, heavily trained army. They are very much a scratch organization who were, were vital to getting us to Baba Amra, which was the place that we, we, myself and Marie, really wanted to get to. It seemed to be the heart of the, of the opposition, and it was also the, the main target on the um, Assad hit list, shall we say. But nothing prepared us for the actual situation in Baba Amra. We'd spent, Marie and I had spent over a year in Libya, two months in Misrata for the siege of Misrata. So we thought, rather smugly, we'd seen it all. Um, but on entering Baba Amra, there wasn't, and this was in the dark, we were being fired on at night. We were coming through back roads. And the situation was Im immediately apparent. Uh, the, this was the destruction. There wasn't a single building, a house, a car, a street, a tree that wasn't in some way scarred by battle. Um, that was the evening when things were quiet. Um, come 6.30 in the morning, the shelling started and it was, it was unlike anything I'd ever witnessed in any of the war zones I'd been to. It, it was systematic and it was continual. It would start in one part of the neighborhood. Baba Amra is in fact a very small neighborhood. This wasn't Misrata where you could actually run somewhere. There is nowhere to run in Baba Amra. Um, they would start, they would shell, they would move on 500 meters and this would happen 16, 18 hours a day, indiscriminate shelling. There's no basements in Baba Amra, so effectively all the women, children who they were trying to protect really had nowhere to go. The best form of defense was to be in a three-story building, which meant that you got three, you could take three hits before you die. But if you're in one of the typical buildings, which was a single-story hit, and you were hit, you were dead. There was, it was that simple. There was, no, there was nowhere to run. Um, it was just relentless bombardment of civilians. The, I know we see the videos on the TV, and they say, cannot be verified, but I assure you they, they can be verified, they have been verified. We saw it, we witnessed it. The shelling was by a professional, well-trained army on a defenseless civilian population. There are no military targets in Baba Amra. The FSA work in small five or six unit group men units who will basically sit and hide in the rubble till a tank attempts to enter. They will try to fight off the tank with light light weapons, RPGs, Kalashnikovs, they're not a, an offensive force, so essentially the regime could sit there, drink coffee, fire mortars, tanks, any weapon they chose they could fire and did fire into the heart of Baba Amra with, with the, no fear of reprisal. There was no sense that this was a war zone where they had to fear a strike back because there was never any, any strike back. So you had an army that could sit, choose targets, do it, 16 hours a day without any fear of reprisal other than a couple of guys running around with cameras doing their best to, to document it. That is in short what is happening in Syria now. Thank you very much. Um, Rana Kavani, you've heard that description. Given what we just heard very powerfully described by Paul, what is the right way to describe the situation in Syria? Is it a civil war or is it something more on the lines that Paul Conroy was describing there, which sounds like the crushing of a civilian protest. 
There is no doubt that this is the crushing, the ferocious, unmitigated, violent, sectarian crushing of a great revolution that is at least 50 years overdue in Syria. I am old enough to remember a Syria that predates the Ba'ath and the Assad years. And my lifetime is one where I witnessed a country diverse, um, uh, argumentative, uh, extraordinary, ethnically and, and spiritually and intellectually, full of creative, um, brave, courageous people, artists like many of the family members that I, I am related to, who were prepared to stand up for their beliefs and write about them and paint them and sculpt them. Now that Syria disappeared in the course of the 50 years since the Ba'ath came to power, especially in the course of the 42 years since Hafez Assad came to power and decided to create a totalitarian state that was based not on a country's aspirations, but on one clan's attempt to hold power, hold power as ruthlessly as possible, and destroy all attempt to, by the Syrian people to say no. Now this went in the manner that we know from other totalitarian regimes um, uh, that we have read about, that were destroyed after the Second World War, and that Europe had to survive. And I think what the Syrian people are going through now is very similar to what uh, European peoples went through in that phase where dictators were still holding on to power as cruelly and as horrifyingly as possible. A gathering such as this with people of different opinions and, and different outlooks um, would be impossible in Syria. If someone raised their hand and said something, one of the moles of the security services that would be planted in this room, at least one, maybe 10, maybe 20, would report to you. You would be arrested. If you were lucky, you would be sent home with a warning. Under the circumstances in the past year, you would disappear or die under horrific torture, as we know so many Syrian men, women, and children have done. I cannot see how such a regime is allowed to stand. We are human beings like everybody else. We deserve to live out a life that is not hindered by oppression of this kind, where corruption isn't the rule, where violence um, isn't the rule, where we do have a right to elect the government that suits us by ballot, and where we have the right to converse freely without fearing what will happen if we say our opinion. Okay. And that is the Syria that 12,000 men and women have died for. Thank you. Um, Roger Cohen, the, the two previous speakers have both given uh, an account of what's going on there that makes it odd to me that so many media outlets do describe this as either a civil war or about to be a civil war because what we've heard from Paul and Rana doesn't fit that description. What do you think is, well, first of all, what do you think is the right way to describe it? And why do you think it is slipping into kind of media coverage or everywhere that, to describe this now as that kind of conflict? You know, first, uh, Jonathan, I had two thoughts uh, listening to Paul. Uh, one was that um, I wanted to listen to you all evening. Uh, there's nothing like the view from the ground. And uh, the view from the ground is particularly hard to get in Syria. And I salute you and everybody who's managed to get in there and provide us at least with glimpses of the horror uh, occurring in Syria as we sit here in West London. Uh, the other was like father, like son. Um, 1980, uh, Hammer, Hammer rules, uh, 20,000 dead uh, under Bashar Assad's father, Hafiz. And uh, enough already. Um, these guys have been um, behaving in this unconscionable way um, for generations now. And, um, you know, that's what the Arab Spring, I think, is about. It's been people have questioned whether it's a spring, whether it's where it's leading. It's going to be uneven. It's going to be difficult. 
but um, the essence of it is um, the freeing and the opening of people's minds and people saying, no, we are not going to let some family uh, run this country like some personal fiefdom. We're not going to have the Assads handing off to their cousins the Maclouse and controlling all the intelligence services. No. We want the kind of more decent society uh, that Rana has just described. And there is no reason to think that the pro it may take, we don't know how long it will take, but in my view there's no reason to think that the process that has moved forward in Egypt, in Libya and Tunisia won't also uh, move forward eventually uh, in Syria. I think the Assads are history. I just don't know when exactly uh, that will happen. Uh, of course in Syria the um, divisions, um, religious, um, ethnic, are uh, um, are great, and I think the reason you see it, this reminds me of Bosnia, I mean, I, which, which uh, the, I covered the war there, uh, and, um, you know, there too, there was a debate. Was this a civil war or, or was it not? Was it, in fact, Belgrade just coming in and hammering uh, the Bosnian Muslims, which was uh, certainly uh, my view of it at the time. Um, I don't think it's a civil war in the sense that one side has all the weapons and the other side right now basically doesn't have any. And what's called the FSA is really just um, a ragtag uh, collection of various militias that are trying to resist as best they can uh, this pounding. Uh, so it's not a civil war in that sense. Um, it is, however, um, the breakdown of a society uh, in which there is going to be um, a fight to the death, I think, because I don't see uh, any solution uh, with the Assad regime uh, still present. So that would be my uh, take on whether it's a civil war or not. Thank you. We'll, we'll come back to all of those thoughts. But um, Father Nadim, what, what's, what, how would you characterize what's going on? Um, <clears throat> first of all, it is, it is tragic. And I say it is not a civil war because I lived the civil war for seven years in Beirut. I was there between 1981 and 1988. And that was civil war. Hmm. And the civil war is completely different in nature and the elements of what make civil war is not in Syria at all. And also... In what way? Can you... In what way? Yeah. Um, first of all, civil war means the society is divided into uh, groups. And each group has a militia. And these militias fight each other from street to street, from house to house, from building to building. We used to wake up in the morning in, in Beirut, and we, we didn't know who got control over the area today. Today would be uh, the Duruz, for example. Um, after a week, we will uh, have three days in the shelter and wake up and surface to the, to, the, to the ground and look around and say, now which militia has got control this week? It will be like the, um, uh, the, the Hezbollah. And every couple of weeks, things shift and militia fight. And um, the horror of civil war is endless and it's incredible. Uh, what in Beirut for seven years was beyond imagination, beyond thinking. I, I faced death many times. I was shot at by, by a machine gun which was suit, suitable for uh, uh, jet fighters. Um, I was, uh, the, the explosion, uh, a huge explosion happened in the same building where I was studying in the university. I was waiting for five seconds to think where I would hold while the building was about to collapse. So in Syria, the whole situation is different. Um, I have to say, it is in the Middle East when it comes to religion, it is sensitive, it is explosive, and emotional. And because of that, 
the religious dimension, a sectarian dimension, is there. We cannot ignore it, we cannot escape from it. But how I describe the situation is there is the opposition, there is the regime, and both are fighting for the power. And the, the, the red line in Syria is the power, the chair. I, don't, I do not see that the red line is neither for the uh, opposition nor for the regime, is the country. Uh, and the difference is enormous. You think the opposition are after power rather after than helping power. the country? Uh, the, now it is, it is what we say in Arabic, kasr azum which means uh, winning or losing the power. So for me, what, what I feel is when I, when I look at the opposition, I don't feel they represent me. When I look at the regime, definitely doesn't represent me. And that implies a kind of equality, a kind of parity between the two. Here are these two forces fighting for power. Do you think that's right? Is there a kind of parity between opposition and government in, in, in Syria? I think who is fighting for the country? Who wants to put the country first rather than the chair, rather than um, grasping the power? And in the next yeah. uh, session, we will talk about what to do about Syria. Yes. And I think the three options, I want to add another option. And at the end, let's see what we think. Good, let's do that. But I think I'm, I'm going to come to you, <laughs> Malik, but I'm going to, Rana Kavani wants to come back on the point that uh, Nadim just made. I disagree totally with what you said, um, simply because there is no real opposition yet that has formed in any political sense. And this is very much to do with the fact that the notion of an opposition has been totally obliterated from Syrian polity and Syrian life and Syrian minds. Um, what we have seen over the past year and weeks is the creation of a groundswell movement that has um, taken over the whole of the country. So it's no longer in Homs or in um, Idlib or in other areas in Syria. It is everywhere in the country. So this parity, so-called parity, simply does not exist. And the idea that the opposition is fighting for a chair, I think is quite, you know, um, bizarre to me, anyway. Paul, you've just heard that exchange there between Rana and Nadim. Um, let's mm. just hear your view of it, because you were there. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's actually very, very simple at the moment. The battle in Syria, the, the conflict in Syria at the moment, it boils down to one word, and that is actually survival. Survival. Stop. Survival. And that's what people are fighting for rather than this. At, at this point in time, people are fighting to stay alive. You know, the, everything I saw indicated no, there was no political push from uh, within Syria. It's a fight to stay alive day to day. Malik Abdi, where do you stand on this debate about what exactly it is we're witnessing in Syria? You've written something uh, that goes through, <coughs> through some of the history as well, which I think might be quite useful, albeit in sort of potted form. But Malik. I'll give a summary, I think. Um, I don't think you can really understand what's happening in Syria without understanding the history of the country. And um, anyone who studied in Syria, you never taught the history of the country before 1970. That's when President Hafez al-Assad assumed power. So in this sort of Orwellian kind of state, uh, history began with the, with the history of the president. <laughs> um, it's my sort of personal opinion that what we are witnessing in Syria and what we also witnessed in Lebanon in the 80s and in, in many ways what we witnessed in Iraq um, is all sort of, we're dealing with the post-Ottoman legacy. All this is a legacy of uh, the collapse of the Ottoman state, which for 400 years provided a stable political system, um, heavily in favor of the Muslims, in a country where there are significant non-Muslim minorities. Um, revolutions very often lead to civil wars. So I have no problem with saying what is happening in Syria is a civil war, because this often happens. It happened in the Russian Revolution that was followed by <coughs> Uh, uh, a civil war and a very, a very bloody one. Who is fighting who in Syria? This is a very important question. Syrians are very sensitive, sensitive to the issue of sectarianism and discussing religion and sectarianism because it's part of the Syrian national identity to not discuss these things. We're all Syrian and we're all Arab and nothing else matters. However, I think this is all false. Uh, I think as Syrians we have to be more honest with each other. The reality of the situation is uh, Syria's non-Sunni religious minorities have accumulated 
uh, a disproportionate uh, political power and also uh, national wealth in their hands over the last 40 years, ever since Hafez al-Assad assumed power, even slightly before. And what we're witnessing now is a revolution by uh, the Sunni working classes who uh, do not enjoy uh, or do not receive a fair share of their national wealth. And also, uh, politically, they have very little representation and very little power. And that's why we see that the areas that are revolting, they tend to be mostly rural areas and also areas that are poor, economically speaking. The, uh, Syria's uh, uh, religious minorities, particularly the Alawites, who constitute around 10% of the population, also Syria's Christians, Druze, Ismailis, uh, they've had it good for about 40 years. Uh, because uh, there is a system of unofficial discrimination in favor of these people. And economically, they've done very well. A, a, a very no, well-known Christian writer recently wrote, Mustafa Khalifa, who is a, a former political prisoner, said that the Christians in Syria represent 5%. That's numerically, they're only 5%. And yet, they represent something like 15 to 20% of the Syrian bourgeoisie. So. This is the primary problem. It's not just economic, but also political. Uh, there is a section of Syrian society that it feels it has very little power. People like those people that you met in Baba Amr, which is a, incidentally a very poor district of, of Homs. So it's a struggle between um, Syria's religious minorities on the one hand, who they control the security forces. Let's have no, you know, no doubt about this. They control the army. They control the security forces and between uh, Sunni working class people who've basically had enough. That's, that's how I would um, represent the struggle that's happening in Syria, and that's why I would say it is a civil war of sorts. Uh, it's a civil war that began following a revolution. And, and is, the, is the um, why now question very simple, that this was inspired by seeing other countries, the rest of the Arab awaken? Absolutely. Every Arab country that has witnessed an Arab Spring it's got a different dynamic in Yemen, it's different from Egypt, different from Tunisia and Libya. And similarly, what happened in Syria was this section of society, long disenfranchised, felt that this is an opportunity for them to voice their frustration. And I don't, I don't think that they, when they first began protesting in Dara in the south, which is again a very sort of poor uh, rural area, that they particularly set out to begin a civil war. And I don't think they even imagined that uh, the situation would be as bad as it is today. So what's the revolution, if I may, that you're referring to that was followed by a civil war? Which revolution? Well, the protest movement that began in Dara, which was peaceful and that spread to other areas, that by, you can say, uh, November, December time became overtly militarized. And I, I, you know, I don't paint, I'm a, Syri I mean, I'm a member of the Syrian opposition, I'm very much against President Bashar, but I don't... Um, I don't like to look at the, the revolution uh, in a sort of rose-tinted kind of way. I'm quite realistic about what the revolution is and what the outcomes are likely to be. Do you want to come back on that, Roger, quickly? Or well, I was... don't really agree on it. I think very fundamentally this is a struggle by a broad swathe of Syrians. I mean, I accept some of the uh, breakdown analysis there. Certainly, there's no question about that, that the Alawites and Christians control a disproportionate amount of power. But I think it's very fundamentally a struggle to overthrow and dismantle a ferocious police state. Yeah. What, what does that, can uh, I, come what does very that actually mean in practice? I mean, this is the question. If you, dis, if you get rid of Bashar al-Assad, this means the Alawite community has, has, has lost power, essentially. Well, we've seen totalitarian governments fall around the world in all sorts of places and repressive dictatorships fall everywhere from South America to Asia. Uh, what we're seeing right now is this process beginning to take hold in the Arab world. And I don't see any reason why uh, Syria has to be an exception. It's a complicated post-Ottoman, as you say, country because the the different um, religions, religions, ethnicities present in Syria, the Shia-Sunni uh, divide that runs right through it. Um, this makes, I mean, when countries get free from under dictatorships, often uh, in multi-ethnic societies, uh, freedom is not interpreted as the freedom to live together. It's interpreted as the freedom to go separate ways, or as we saw in Yugoslavia, or oppress each other. The great struggle in Syria 
in a post-Assad world will be to ensure that um, minorities and the majority enjoy equal rights, but we're a long way from that. Let, let's, get, let's get, Michael, you're the last one to come in on this first round. We've heard different versions here of what's going on, that it's either the crushing by a brutal police state of an uprising, it's a, a religious, a battle of religious minorities against the religious majority, or even this battle over the chair of power, the seat mm. of power. How do you see it? Um, well, I started looking at the uprising before it was actually a revolution. I think this is an important distinction to make. What happened in Syria, actually, if you want to be technical, it didn't start in Dara, it started in Damascus, in the old city. Um, it was a call for reform, specifically economic reforms. I mean, to understand the nature of this regime, you have to appreciate that it, in many respects, resembles a classic totalitarianism, European style or Soviet totalitarianism, but one that is fused with a kind of mafia state. Um, sort of economic uh, substructure. In this respect, I think its relationship with Russia is actually very telling, um, both from the Soviet and the, the Putin periods. Uh, the, the calls were, look, we, we want, as, as Malik was uh, alluding to, I think he's quite, quite, quite right to say that it, in many respects, is a working class uprising. We, we want the kind of enfranchisement and the econo economic opportunities that um, this sort of ruling sector clan has had. But also, I mean, look, there are plenty of Sunnis who work within the apparatus of the state. They're in the Mukhabarat, they're in the army, they're in the regime itself. Um, Bashar al-Assad's wife is, is a Sunni. So this has sort of complicated the picture of this sectarian um, uh, sort of overhang of, of the nature of this uprising. I, I will also say this, look, uh, this is absolutely 100% a brutal brutal campaign, a campaign in many respects of extermination. I mean, there have been instances of ethnic cleansing in Syria. The, the real history of this conflict is yet to be written. It may take decades for us to fully understand what has gone on. Uh, there is no moral equivalence between the opposition and the regime. The opposition are committing human rights abuses. Well, the rebels in Bosnia and Kosovo committed them as well. This is to be expected. The definition, de definition of brutalizing a population is to make them act as brutes. Uh, this is exactly what we're beginning to see. This is my concern, and I know we'll get to this in the second section, session. Um, look, I've talked to plenty of activists, and I've talked to plenty of rebels. Uh, what, what struck me, particularly in June of 2011, this uprising was led mostly by young men, apolitical young men in their 20s or early 30s. A lot of them have been sort of actuated by digital technology. It's facile to refer to this as a Facebook revolution or a Facebook uprising, but let's not mistake the importance that the internet and the access to information, particularly non-regime information, has had. They didn't have a party platform or any kind of political doctrine, but what they all said resem vaguely resembled the same thing. They all agreed that Syria was a multi-ethnic, uh, and confessional mosaic. They all enshrined the rights in a post-Assad state to keep that in place. Uh, and it's telling to look at the nomenclature that the opposition has used from the beginning. One of the early Friday days of rage was called the Azadi Friday, which is the Kurdish word for freedom. Uh, so th the notion that this is a sort of Sunni supremacist or a, a kind of, you know, uh, a, a, an intrinsically sectarian affair, I, I, would, I would take issue with that. What I will say, however, is the longer it drags on, uh, don't, don't mistake Bashar al-Assad's intention here. He realizes that some of these post-Ottoman uh, tendencies are very much latent and they're now becoming blatant. The regime has done everything in its power to prey upon and exploit those tendencies. I mean, the, the Shabia, the, the roving death squads or gangs, are overwhelmingly Alawites. Objectively, this is a sectarian conflict, if not yet subjectively, but the longer it carries on, okay. I do think that that will become a major Brian factor. Brian wants to come back. Before she does, I want you to get, get us into this now, this sort of second <coughs> phase of this conversation and, and the what should be done uh, part of it.